Good morning. Uh, I am Professor Gigi Roy. I am giving a course on iron making and steel making. And this is my first lecture. And this is the module 1, lecture 1 on introduction. And the major concept clear in this section is I will just talk about what is the difference between iron and steel because we are teaching iron and steel making. So, first of all, I will assume the class is very novice, and so you need to know what is called iron and what is called steel. And then I will talk about the definition of iron making and steel making. Basically, what do you mean by iron making and steel making uh, from a uh, layman's perspective? And then, world could steel production scenario today, just today, who is producing how much and what is the position of India? And then, of course, what is the basic thermodynamics of iron making and steel making in very brief, which will be discussed in details in later on. So, first let us differentiate between iron and steel. What do you mean by iron and steel? Basically, iron and steel both are basically an alloy of carbon in iron, as you all know. So, it is basically an alloy, both iron and steel is an alloy of carbon in iron. Only difference in iron and steel becomes because in case of the steel, iron content do not exceed 2.14. In case of iron, there is a, there is in case of the steel, carbon do not exceed 2.14 percent to 8 percent and in case of iron, it is greater than 2.14 uh, percent and it can be up to 6.69 when the structure is totally cemented. Okay. So, this is basically the difference and we should better understand this in terms of iron carbon diagram. And, and this is a very well known diagram in metallurgy. It is basically a binary phase diagram between iron and carbon. On x axis, carbon is increasing from 0 to 6.67 because beyond 6.67, iron forms a iron carbide. So, and you can find the different stable phases here. And what is steel? Steel is basically the when the carbon from 0 to 2.14 percentage, it is called the steel and beyond that it is called the cast iron. And uh, what happens basically, pure iron is basically a very soft material, very malleable. And as we introduce some impurity like carbon into it, it becomes stronger, the strength increases. That is why the strength of the steel is very high compared to pure iron. But if you go on increasing the carbon, what happens? then carbon cannot be accommodated into the structure, it precipitates in the form of iron carbide, too much of iron carbide, localized precipitation and then or maybe in the form of graphite flakes of carbon, graphite. And so, that becomes a cast iron. In case of the cast iron, since it is carbon rich, it becomes brittle. And because of brittleness, its formability decreases. You cannot form by conventional deformation route like forging, it become very difficult because they are brittle. So, they will break during the forming process, but they have a very good castability, especially when some impurities are present like silicon and that is why they are called the cast iron, you can easily cast it. But in steel, steel is still formable and as, as at the same time, it has sufficient strength because carbon is there into the iron structure, you have incorporated the carbon, the strength is high but at the same time it is formable. You can use any form of, uh, forming techniques to deform steel and give different shapes. It is not required to be cast only. So, that is very important. So, after casting bloom or uh, slab casting by continuous casting, you can give different shapes starting from thin made, thin sheet to wear to any other shapes later on. So, this is basically the basic difference and in case of the steel, you can find the major structure is called basically at this, I am not going into the basically the physical metallurgy. Basically, it can be a 0.76 percent carbon, you can get a structure called the pearlite, which is a alternate layer of ferrite and cementite. Ferrite is nothing but a solid solution of carbon in iron, where carbon percentage in iron is very less, maximum it is around 0.02 percent, weight percent of carbon is there, that is called the ferrite. It is a very soft material and then cementite is basically an intermediate compound between iron and carbon is quite hard. They form a laminar structure called the pearlite and if your carbon composition is below 0.76, it is called hypo eutectoid steel, where your structure is basically pearlite and ferrite 
and if it is greater than 0.76, then your structure is pearlite and cementite. It is little harder, but both the eutectoid and hypereutectoid still, hypereutectoid and the hypereutectoid still both are formable and with the sufficient strength. Anyway, different category of steel up there, there is a low carbon steel, medium carbon steel and high carbon steel based on that. So that is basic difference and then this is the reference I have taken from wave, so you can get it. And the cast iron, so we can see this is the cast iron is more castable, its castability is more, its formability is less and steel is more malleable and formable. That is the important thing. So in this uh, slide, we basically talk about the basic definition of iron making and steel making. What do we mean by iron making? And uh, in case of iron making, we know the ore of iron, the richest ore of iron are basically the oxide in nature, that is oxide ore. And uh, two major oxide ores are there. One is called the hematite, uh, that is called the magnetite. That is the hematite ore is uh, hematite. In hematite, the mineralogy is basically uh, that is Fe2O3, Fe2O3 and uh, plus the gang. Gang basically you have Fe2O5, Fe2O5, you have MnO, you have SiO2, okay. So these are, these are basically the gang constituents, these are basically undesirable and this is, this is Fe2O3 is called the, uh, is Fe2O3 is around in case of the good grade of hematite ore is around 90 percent and uh, Fe2O3 contains around 70 percent, this contains 70 percent iron, you can simply see from the stoichiometry, so 70 percent iron is there. So total iron in hematite, there is a total iron in hematite is around total iron total iron is around your uh, 90, that is a 63 percent, 9, 7 is a 63, 63 percent is total iron in hematite, that is a good grade hematite ore and uh, basically iron contained, total iron contained in hematite can vary from 60 to 65 percent, depending on what is the percentage of Fe2O3 into the hematite ore, okay. Similarly, we have another ore called the magnetite, there the mineralogy is basically Fe3O4. Anyway, so hematite ore, uh, what is required? Basically, what we'll do from the oxide ore, we want to take out the oxygen. If we can take out the oxygen, then it becomes iron. If it two or three become iron, but that is not sufficient. You have the gang material with it, so that also has to be separated by somehow. Anyway, so if you take an iron oxide, how you can reduce it? From your twelve knowledge, you know basically iron oxide can be effectively reduced by carbon under high temperature this is called the carbothermic reduction. So, so carbothermic reduction basically we need now carbon and then if you have to give some temperature it requires around 1000 degree centigrade because this reduction is highly endothermic you know most of the direct it is called direct reduction iron oxide is reacting with the solid carbon that is called a direct reduction at high temperature it takes place and this direct reduction usually very endothermic and it requires at least 1000 degree centigrade. You will know the meaning of it in future lecture, why 1000 degree centigrade is required, but it requires really a high temperature. Then what you can get, the product will be two things. One is basically the solid product of iron and the gang, because you are not separating the gang yet. So, so what you are basically doing, we are taking out the oxygen from the iron ore and by reacting it with carbon at 1000 degree centigrade, right. So this is one approach. So other approach basically and then what you can do if you want to take out the gang from the solid product, then you can do because it is a solid state reduction because iron is not molten. So you cannot separate in terms of slag metal separation because 1000 degree centigrade iron still in the solid state and gang is intermixed with it. So what you can do, you can basically make some beneficiation, you can take out some amount of the gang which is liberable, which is liberated and then you can melt it into electric arc furnace, okay. So that is one way, but here it is the solid product of iron. So another approach is therefore, you take start with an iron ore and then you add carbon, but that is not sufficient. You add flux also, basically you want to make a 
solid liquid separation. So, if you want to make slag or out of undesirable oxide, it requires some kind of flux. But here the temperature is also required to be little higher, say around maximum 1400 degree centigrade. This is quite high 1300 to 1400 degree centigrade that will be required and if you give that you can get two product here, the liquid iron and the liquid slag. So, basically the gang you have separated in terms of slag now. So, you get a pure liquid product, liquid iron and then you get a uh, liquid iron obviously some impurities are there and then you have liquid slag. Not unlike in the other process, they are only you have removed in the previous process you have removed only oxygen from the iron ore, all the gang is remaining with it, then you have to think out how to take out the gang. So, here when you uh, in this process, in the second process basically little higher temperature and you add some flux. So, you can take out the gang in the form of liquid slag. Now, here what you are doing basically you are taking out the oxygen also you are making a slag metal separation by adding flux at higher temperature. Now, if the liquid iron has typical composition around 4 to 5 percent carbon is there, 1.5 percent it varies 1 to 1.5 percent silicon may be there and then 0.4 percent phosphorus will be there and then 0 0.05 sulphur. Basically as you will see in case of the blast furnace it is highly reducing condition and sulphur is removed only under the reducing condition. So, you can remove the sulphur effectively from the liquid iron in uh, blast furnace whereas ok. So, but how this, this is basically you can find. So, this is the typical composition of typical composition of hot metal 0.5 percent carbon, 1.5 silicon and phosphorus. So, these are basically this is this is the impurity that you have to reduce significantly because they are coming because it is a reducing process. So, like iron is getting reduced others also getting reduced like silicon, silica is coming from the silicon is coming from the silica, phosphorus is coming from reduction of direct reduction of P2O5. So, phosphorus, silicon all are coming into this since it is a liquid state. So, its diffusion is also higher. So, they go into the system and carbon comes to approximate the saturation level because uh, you are reducing by carbon. So, it is it becomes liquid still becomes saturated with the carbon. So, if you see the iron carbon diagram at 1200 degree centigrade it will be around 4, 4 to 5 percent. So, and more than that if the temperature is little higher. So, now this is the composition of the hot metal. So, this hot metal or the liquid iron is not as I said this is called a liquid iron and they are not formable, they are castable, but they are not formable. So, you have to remove the impurities significantly. If the impurities is lower down, then the iron become converted to a product called the steel which is malleable. So, that is the idea of the steel making, only you reduce the impurities such that it become more malleable, more tough ok. So, that is called the steel making process and uh, so this is your what you are doing here uh, for steel making you are adding some oxygen and as well as the flux. Oxygen you are giving basically to oxidize the impurities and you are giving flux such that whatever the impurity oxide come, comes above they have to be flux and can be retained into the slag because otherwise they can again go back to the liquid steel. So, to do that and also flux is needed for some element like phosphorus as I will see as you will see later on ok. And without flux without basic slag you cannot remove the phosphorus. Silicon carbon is possible, but if you have a flux basically it retains the impurity into the slag. So, they will not be able to revert back to the liquid steel. So, and then that that is called a process called the steel making and liquid steel has a composition less than 2 percent carbon. So, from 4 to 5 percent carbon you can come down to less than 2 percent carbon and silicon become less than 0 0.018 weight percent that is 100 ppm, phosphorus 0 0.05 ok. And then sulphur remains like this because under steel making under oxidizing condition you cannot remove the sulphur any further. So, sulphur whatever you have been removed into the iron making you cannot improve it further. So, that is why some external desulphurization is required because sulphur is the only element which can be reduced under which can be removed under reducing atmosphere. All other elements can be reduced under the oxidizing atmosphere. 
oxidizing and basic slag condition. Okay, so in the steel making, the process is oxidizing and basic. So you can remove carbon, manganese, silicon, phosphorus significantly, but you cannot remove the sulfur because sulfur cannot be removed in the form of sulfate where it is oxidized form. It can be removed in the form of sulfide which is a reduced form. Okay. So, sulfur only be reduced under the reducing condition. So, this is the steel making condition. So, this is the basic definition of iron making and steel making. So, what you do basically in case of the iron making, we take the um, oxide ore of iron and we reduce it by carbon and flux at little higher temperature. So, maximum 1400 degree centigrade is sufficient, 1300 to 1400 degree centigrade we can get two product liquid iron and liquid slag. And here we do two purpose, one thing is that from the oxide we take out the oxygen and also we make the slag metal separation at high temperature by using flux. And the whatever the uh, product we get is called the hot metal or the liquid iron and it has a composition around 4 to 5 percent carbon, 1.5 percent silicon, 0.4 percent phosphorus and 0.05 sulfur. And then what we do, we basically we need a another reactor called the steel making reactor where basically we remove the impurities, right, carbon, silicon, phosphorus to a significant level such that the steel, there is a liquid iron become malleable under solid condition, okay. So, such that you can give it to a different shape. So, that is called the liquid steel. So, in the liquid steel, um, we get less than 2 percent carbon, less than 100, around 100 ppm of silicon, 500 ppm of phosphorus, 500 ppm of sulfur. Another thing I said is the sulfur cannot be removed on the steel making condition, which is oxidizing condition. To remove steel sulfur, only reducing condition is needed, which is possible under the blast furnace or under uh, iron making condition only. Okay. So, then let us see the world scenario. So, we understand now what is iron and steel and what is called the iron making and steel making. And let us have a look of the crude steel production today. You can see here that is the chronological development of iron production over the world. So, in 1950 it was only 189 million ton, today we are producing 1808 million tons. And if you see the share of different uh, countries, you can find you can find that China is producing around 50 percent of the uh, world steel production. 50 percent is produced by China, and uh, and Japan and India is producing almost same. Basically, the India is producing around 106 million ton. Japan is producing 104 million ton. So that's why India just uh, take over Japan and become the second largest producer of steel. And India in near future is going to be the second uh, that is the India is trying to produce 300 million ton of steel by 2030. So, India is growing in that respect and by 2030. And next let us see the steel consumption pattern. So, if you see the apparent steel use that is the per capita steel consumption that is the per person how much steel you are consuming. If you see in that case there is a South Korea is consuming the maximum 1000 uh, more than 1000 kg per person and another country like China, Japan, USA all in the range of China and Japan is consuming around 600 and 500 okay. So, like this. So, yeah, by compared to India, if you consider India per capita consumption is quite low, there is a 70.9, but you must take into account the population also. And from that point of view, you can see that China is producing the largest amount of steel, but per capita consumption is less than that of South Korea because of population. China has a large population. So, but if you see the consumption wise, uh, China is the major consumption, there is the maximum consumer of steel today. And India is also domestic consumption of steel in India is also growing and um, very soon India is going to consume more than 90 million ton per annum and took up the second place surpassing the USA. USA now consuming maybe 90 more 90 to 100 million tons of steel per annum. So, India is also targeting in that way. Okay. And this figure what you can find is only the per capita consumption kg of steel per person. 
Okay. Now, I will discuss about very briefly the basic thermodynamics of iron making and steel making. Okay. And uh, it will be a very brief outline and uh, later on I will go into details. Okay. Now, I will just show you one Ellingham diagram that is very relevant to the iron making and steel making and you are most of you know about this Ellingham diagram. This is the Ellingham diagram and it basically shows uh, the standard free energy change for a metal metal oxide system as a function of temperature. As you can see for different oxides you have separate different lines are there. This is basically variation of standard free energy of a respective oxide with temperature. And what are the benefits of this diagram? Basically from this oxide Ellingham diagram what you can find is that uh, a oxide that is lying in higher in position in the Ellingham diagram is less stable compared to an oxide which is lying or which is positioned lower in the Ellingham diagram. Because the standard free energy change for example, say silicon oxide silicon silica. So, standard free energy change for the formation of silica form is elemental form this is a silicon is at a particular temperature if you see at a particular temperature the standard free energy change for SiO2 is much negative compared to say FeO compared to FeO it is much negative compared to FeO. So, what does it mean? Basically, if you see say at certain temperature let us say at 1000 degree centigrade around that this is your SiO2 this is minus say it is how much it will be minus 160 I am just telling and if you compare this if you just add this temperature so, so this line if you consider then Fe 3 O 4. So, that is much higher Fe 3 O 4 is around say whatever value. So, it is much more negative that is the standard free energy change for SiO 2 formation is much more negative compared to Fe 3 O 4 formation or the FeO formation. FeO formation is this it is further less for FeO formation. It means that is your it means that SiO 2 is much stable compared to FeO or Fe 3 O 4 whatever it may be at that temperature. So, this is one thing. So, what does it mean basically uh, if I have silicon silicon will be able to reduce the iron oxide. Okay. So, if you write this so we can easily write an equation like this FeO FeO if you write plus silicon right you will be able to form Fe plus SiO2 because SiO2 is a much stable compound oxide compared to FeO. So, if you will be unstable in presence of silicon and silicon will be oxidized to silica and iron oxide will be reduced to iron. So, that is the Ellingham diagram says that at any temperature you can see the silica line is much lower compared to the FeFuO line. This is the FeFuO line, this is FeFuO line, this is the silica line. So, FeFuO line silica line is always much below than that of the FeFuO line. So, this is the thing. So, this is one important thing that is the Ellingham diagram says. So, this provides the standard energy change that I said and also the oxide staying lower in the diagram are more stable compared to the oxide staying above. So, an element staying in the lower in the Ellingham diagram will be able to reduce any oxide above it. So, that is one thing. Another thing is that it also provides the temperature dependence of relative stability of the compounds. Obviously, you can see as a function of temperature. So, all the lines are plotted as you can see most of the oxides they become less stable at higher temperature because the line is positive slope all the line do have the positive slope for this thing SiO2, MnO, Fe 3O4 or FeO whatever line we can find except this, this line except this line all the lines have a positive slope all the line has a positive slope that means they become less stable at higher temperature whereas CO carbon monoxide become more stable at higher temperature. This is the difference between these thing if you can see that is the uh, provides the temperature dependence of relative stability of the compound. So, CO become progressively CO become progressively stable at higher temperature 
where if you become progressively less stable at higher temperature, similarly all other SiO2, MnO all become progressively less stable at higher temperature, where CO become more stable at higher temperature. That is basically the reason why the CO is used as a reductant. Okay? So, you can see at high temperature CO become very stable and progressively stable and it can easily reduce any of the iron oxide present. Even the, the most stable oxide iron among the iron oxide Fe2, 3, Fe3, 4, FeO, Fe is the most stable, but at high temperature CO can easily reduce FeO to Fe. So, that is why that is the carbon is used as a reductant uh, for oxide reduction. It is most of the cases uh, there is the oxide reduction carbon is used as an reductant and carbon was also at that time easily available as a fossil fuel, right. But you can argue also you can use the silicon also from thermodynamics point of view you can use silicon also to reduce the FeO. Yes, it is possible because silica is much stable compared to FeO almost at uh, very high temperature also you can find issue line is much below even at high temperature. SiO2 is more stable compared to FeO, but the problem is that the product of this reaction that is the reaction that I written is FeO plus Si forming SiO2 plus Fe. So, product of the reaction is SiO2 is a solid product. Okay. So, in that case SiO2 has to be kept into the slag by adding flux you have to flux it because it is a solid product SiO2. So, you have to flux it and keep it into the slag otherwise the silica can you can revert back. So, in that case your volume of the slag will also very increase, I will increase and the process may not be very efficient. Compared to that if you use the carbon the product is CO is a gas. So, gas can easily move away from the system you do not require to be arrested into the slag and all these things even without making the slag you can carry out. So, that is the thing. So, that is why the carbon is a better reductant from that point of view because the product of oxidation of carbon is gas. Anyway, so, so this is what I want. So, uh, that is why there is the carbothermic reduction is used and uh, now let us go to the steel making case. So, we have seen for iron reduction because for iron making carbon is well accepted reductant material because CO become progressively stable at high temperature and the CO is also a gaseous state that of the advantage. And in steel making what we do basically we have to oxidize these impurities right and we have to oxidize this impurity preferentially over iron. Because when you charge the oxygen into liquid iron what will happen the liquid iron constitutes, are, constitutes around 95 percent of the total charge only 5 percent may be the summation of the all other impurities. So, 95 percent by weight percent is the iron. So, if you charge oxygen by law of mass, mass action or by the kinetically it is the iron that will get oxidized first. And then basically if the impurity oxide are stable much much stable than iron oxide then those impurity will reduce the iron oxide and they will get oxidized and iron will be revert back to the system. Actually that happens you can see SiO2 if you see, if you see SiO2, MnO and the CO, these are all oxides that is the SiO2, MnO, CO are much much uh, that is much much stable compared to your FeO, compared to FeO. If you consider this thing compared to FeO, this SiO2, MnO, CO all are much 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 stable. So, as a result what happens if FeO form also that is the reaction that take place first FeO form, but FeO then can revert back to iron and Si impurity silicon will reduce the iron oxide FeO to Fe and it will itself gets get oxidized to SiO2. Similarly, Men will be oxidized to MnO and carbon will be oxidized to CO and FeO will revert back to the liquid as iron. So, this is possible. So, you can find for removing the silicon manganese is carbon it is readily possible, but what is not possible is the phosphorus. If you see the Ellingham diagram, if you see this diagram, if you see then this is the phosphorus line, this is sorry, this is this is the phosphorus line and this is the phosphorus line 
and your this is the iron line you can find this is the iron red is the iron line and green is the phosphorus line what you can find that high temperature it is the phosphorus p2o5 become more stable compared to fuo hey there is fuo become more stable compared to p2o5 right p2 fuo line is lower than that of the p2o5 line so uh, if you is more stable compared to P2O5, when P2O5 is in pure state, obviously, when P2O5 is pure, under standard state, you can find that if you is more stable because it has more negative standard free energy change. At higher temperature also, at this temperature, this temperature is quite high. So, high temperature you can find at this temperature, it is higher than this. So, it is not possible under standard state, under pure state, it is quite impossible that phosphorus. So, this reaction, if I consider this reaction, if I consider this reaction FeO, FeO plus P, just like this, P2O5 plus Fe, this is not possible. This is not possible. That is FeO plus P, FeO plus P forming P2O5 and iron, it is not at all possible because because FU is more stable than P2O5, understand the state. So, what has to be done? If you can make, if you can add some flux and add the P2O5 into the flux or you make a very strong compound of uh, P2O5 along with the flux, like if you use the lime CaO, if you add CaO, then P2O5 form a very strong compound with the lime, like that is called the tricalcium silicate 3 CO P2O5 and where the activity of P2O5 become very, very low because it is so strong compound, the activity coefficient become very less and the activity become much, much less than 1, very of the order of say 10 to the minus uh, uh, 18, 17 like that. So, it is, it is a very strong compound. So, if you can do that, then the activity of P2O5 will go down and what happens is that so, in that case, fluxing up, that is why the fluxing of helps in lowering the phosphorus line under non standard case for selective removal of phosphorus. And how does it do that? You can see under non standard state what happens. You have this reaction 4 by P, that is the, this is the reaction phosphorus reacting with the oxygen, one mole of oxygen forming the P2O5. This is the reaction, standard reaction into the Ellingham diagram because Ellingham diagram you always one mole of oxygen. Okay. So, this is and the you can write the equilibrium constant like this k is equal to just like a of activity of P2O5 to the power 2 fifth divided by activity of phosphorus to the power 4 5 and partial pressure of oxygen. And, and the phosphorus is pure, so it is 1, phosphorus is 1, activity is 1 and one thing is that this is phosphorus, sorry, phosphorus activity is 1, phosphorus activity is 1 and then your P2O5 what I wanted to say that the activity of phosphorus is equal to 1. So, if you reduce the activity of P2O5, basically if you flux the P2O5, then its activity decreases. If you decrease it and since the equilibrium constant at a particular temperature is constant, equilibrium constant only varies with the temperature. So, at a particular temperature equilibrium is constant, equilibrium constant is a constant number. And so, if you reduce the numerator by reducing the activity of P2O5, your denominator P2 partial pressure of oxygen has to decrease to keep K constant, right. So, then apparently standard free energy change that is defined as minus RTL in K or RTL of PO2 that will since the PO2 decreases your apparent delta G0 will decrease. So, what does it mean that is the under non-standard state the apparent line for P2O5 will come down that is the thing. So, so this thing there is apparent P2O5 line, you can find the apparent P2O5 line under non-standard condition, they have come down. That is shown by the dotted line. So, dotted line is the range depending on how much you are making the, how much flux you are adding, this is the two lines, okay, where the apparent P2O5 line has been shifted. Because apparently delta G0, standard free energy change has changed because you have reduced the activity of P2O5. It is no more in the standard state, it is non-standard state. So, apparent delta G0, basically in the Ellingham diagram, if I superimpose the non-standard state condition, then those are the uh, dotted line. 
So, you can find now under non standard condition you can find the P2O5 obviously much more stable compared to the FeO because this line are much below than the Fe FeO line. So, now you can selectively remove pit phosphorus over iron because now in this case if you add flux then if you will be able to reduce the P2O5. Okay. So, that is the if you basically the source of oxygen because it remains in the slag source of oxygen. So, your 4 by 5 P plus you can write also FeO okay, twice FeO plus 3 CO you can form your 2 by 5 there is a P2O5 into 3 CO calcium phosphate. Okay. So, now the FeO will be able to do. So, if you uh, under non standard condition if you add the flux. So, what I wanted to tell is that if you add the flux then FeO plus phosphorus plus your CaO then it is possible I am, I am writing it just uh, one minute just uh, what I want to say it is possible to form P2O5 plus into Ti calcium silicate that is basically into 3 CaO right. So, this is the thing you can do PO plus P plus CaO then it can form the P2O5 into 3 CaO that is called the here you have to give the basically the 3 CaO ok. So, if you give FeO plus P plus 3 CaO it will form the tri calcium silicate P2O5 3 CaO it is possible. So, only under non standard state it is possible to, to reduce the phosphorus. So, that is the selective removal of phosphorus ok. So, uh, for removing the silicon manganese and carbon it not necessarily you have to add the basic flux or lime, but if you want to remove the phosphorus selectively over iron a fluxing is essential that is why the steel making process are basically the basic process. Obviously, the basic slag also help in removing the silica manganese silica oxide specially because if you have a flux that will also arrest the silica into the slag. Okay. So, in that case the reaction will further move in the forward direction that is the silicon removal is also uh, enhanced by the basic slag, but for phosphorus it is essential. If you do not lime you cannot remove phosphorus selectively over iron ok. And why do you want to make the selective uh, uh, obviously you understand that the selective removal of impurity is essential otherwise iron will also lost into the slag that you do not want because then iron yield will be very less ok. So, that is the thing. So, this is the very basic thermodynamics of iron making and steel making and we will come elaborately later in the classes. You can see the conclusion that is the these are the some summary summary what we said in this lecture is that we have said differentiate between the iron and steel and we have said that both iron and steel are the alloy of carbon in iron and but carbon in the steel is less than 2 percent, but less than 2 percent and it is strong malleable and deformable and can be shaped by any deformation technique like loading, load, uh, rolling, forging and liquid iron on the other hand has more customability, but very brittle, but cannot be given shape by the rolling, forging like deformation techniques. Okay. So, in that case you have to give the shape by casting only and since it has flowability you can give intricate casting uh, intricate shape for the liquid iron by using liquid iron, but you cannot form it by deformation technique. That is why the liquid iron is usually converted to the steel okay, and, and fabricated different and pro different products are fabricated. Liquid iron is produced by removing ore oxygen by carbothermic reduction okay, and fluxing of gang for slag metal separation and you have to flux the gang for slag metal separation. So, that is done in the major reactor called the blast furnace where basically you get the liquid iron product by separating the gang in the form of a slag. And steel making process selectively oxidize the impurity in iron in liquid iron by oxygen lensing 
and that is why you need a basic slag as I said for phosphorus you must have a basic slag otherwise also basic slag also helps in removing the silicon and all this because, because that is the silica can be arrested into the slag and the reaction move activity of silica become less as a result reaction move further in the forward direction ok. And uh, India is the as I said the Indian scenario regarding the steel making is that India is today the second largest producer of steel and it is targeting 300 million by 2030 and also consumption wise also steel consumption is increasing in India. Although the per capita steel consumption is 70 kg only, but if we see the collectively what is the steel consumption we are very close to USA and we are consuming near about 90 million ton and we want to surpass this thing, uh, surpass this target to 100 million ton ok and exceed the and become the second largest steel consumer of the world. Presently China is the largest steel consumer and is per capita consumption also very high around 600 kg per person in spite of huge population in China. And, uh, and India from that point of view is far behind, but we are uh, second largest producer at least after China. Although we are producing only 106 million ton per annum, China is producing more than 1000 million ton and also our per capita is 70 and uh, consumption and China is 600. But consumption wise we are going, we are total consumption wise we are also going ahead. Thank you very much.